This is the Fermilab Remote Operations Center. So this provides a place for scientists to participate in the CMS experiment. It's really exciting being involved on a project of this scope with collaborators around the world. You, you feel that uh, the global nature of this project every day as you think about even the, the time difference, the seven hour time difference. Here in, in Batavia, we're 40 miles outside of Chicago, but we're 4,000 miles from the experiment location in Geneva. And um, we, we can do a lot of the same things that are done in that control room, we can do in this room. Uh, one of the things people notice first when they walk in is a 24-hour-a-day uh, live uh, video connection between the different control room sites. And so this live video display lets us communicate with our colleagues at the different remote and central uh, control rooms. If you ever wave, do they wave back? Hi, can you hear us in the uh, 0.5 control room from, Perm uh, from Fermilab? Yes. Ah, uh, hi. So, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if it's okay with you, can you step back a, a foot or so and, and wave hello? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, hi. There's a lot of people like myself who actually are working on both experiments in Batavia and at the LHC. So right away you can tell we're, we're pushing for both of them. We'd like both of them to succeed and are excited about developments uh, at, at experiments at either site. We'll see uh, an event that flashes up on a screen that looks interesting, and then we know we're going to have something interesting to look at in our, our physics analysis. It's important for Fermilab to continue working on the energy uh, frontier experiments, uh, which are right now starting up at CERN, so that we, we maintain our involvement in the, the forefront of this research. So this is a bird's eye view of the Fermilab site. You could see all the different rings, which are different accelerators, and all the different lines, which are beam lines. And right here is Wilson Hall, our high rise. Everything starts right on the west side of Wilson Hall over here. So we start out with a bottle of hydrogen, and that's where we get our protons from. And we bring them down this first accelerator here. This is our linear accelerator where we pump energy into there, and as the particles travel down the accelerator, they get faster and faster and faster. Now the problem is, if we wanted to get them as fast as we need to get them, we'd have to make this linear accelerator really long. So instead, at the end of the linear accelerator, we shoot the particles into a circular accelerator. Our first circular accelerator here is called the booster. And each time the particles go around the booster, they get faster and faster and faster, till they get to the maximum energy that we can get them in the booster. So after that, we take them out of the booster, we bring them into this ring here, this is the main injector. We play the same trick as they go around, they get faster and faster and faster until we get them up to the perfect energy, the sweet spot for doing different things with them. So one of the things we used to do with protons in the main injector is we'd shoot them into the Tevatron ring. And we'd also shoot them over here, make anti-protons and shoot those into the Tevatron ring. We'd bring those together in different collisions at the CDF experiment and the D0 experiment, and we'd search for new particles in the proton-antiproton collisions. So as you've just seen, Fermilab is located in, outside of Chicago, and uh, I've never even heard of the little town Batavia or whatever. It's, it all seems like a big Mandela effect to me, but apparently this place has been around since the 1960s, and they had a big... Acceler particle accelerator slash collider that uh, actually took photography pictures. Um, it was called the Tevatron. And here are some of their accomplishments. Um, they have found all these quarks and, you know, muons and all kinds of things that CERN does. Um, basically, it's the predecessor of CERN that I've somehow never heard about. Um, Anyway, of course I'll put a link to the movie that I got all these shots from in the description, but I wanted to say, um, this has been deeply unnerving <laughs> to me because I felt the whole time while I was watching this like a sense of overwhelming deja vu. Um, this movie, like I had seen it before, in fact more than that like I had memories of my dad telling me about it and <clears throat> I know 
My dad did not tell me about it. As crazy as it sounds, I think it was implanted memories. <laughs> as I was watching this, I felt like I had memories. All of a sudden, memories about Fermilab. So it's very possible that um, I was experiencing the implanted memories of a Mandela effect. But anyway, back to Fermilab. We push the envelope. We do new things here. If you have an imagination, if you can come up with new types of things and new ways of doing things, this is a place to be. I think the future of Fermilab is inevitably tied to doing new things, having new ideas, exploring those ideas. Some of those ideas come up to be things that actually take you down a path that you never thought of doing before. And this happens in high energy physics all the time, like the World Wide Web and using neutrons for cancer therapy. And all these sort of things happen because we have some very imaginative people at Fermi Laboratory who say, I wonder what would happen if I did this. We've got you know, thousands of volts, thousands of amps powering all this equipment in the tunnel. Nobody can go in there. Normally the accelerators run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, continually providing beam to the experiments. Um, however, usually about once a year we shut down for maintenance and sometimes for other upgrades. These experiments have been running for a long time, CDF over there, D0 over there. We've been taking data like gangbusters, and now we've got billions and billions of events. So all that information is now on tapes that are all sitting in the computing division. The next step is really going through that data again and again and again. Are there new things, new, new particles that we could find? Is there information that we have that can help the LHC? If the LHC discovers something, can we come back and say, what information do we have here? The two data sets together is gonna give us a lot more information. So it's, it's gold. It's Fort Knox over there. That's our Fort Knox. And that's a process that will go on for the next decade. The other thing we can do with protons in the main injector is we can shoot them into different beam lines and smash them into the different targets and get all sorts of different things coming out and have a different sets of experiments in all these different buildings that you see along these beam lines here. Now something that we've only started doing in the last decade and what we'll continue to do is take protons out of the main injector, shoot them into a target, and make a beam of neutrinos. And so we have a neutrino beam line here that goes all the way to Minnesota, and then we're gonna have a neutrino beam line that comes around here and goes all the way to South Dakota for, for neutrino experiments out there. So with this complex of accelerators, we could do just about anything you'd ever want to do with protons. A lot of people think that Fermilab is a laboratory that's just physicists, a bunch of people in lab coats just doing physics research. And in reality, they're not the majority of the people here. No physicist makes this equipment, installs the equipment, and maintains it. That's done by machinists, it's done by engineers, a lot of technicians to maintain and, and install and upgrade the systems. Um, in addition to that, of course, we have all the, the people keeping the whole lab running. Uh, high voltage yeah. electricians, mechanics, somewhere there's an accountant that pays me every month. I don't know how that works, but you know, this is a, a very diverse group of people here. That's one of the things I really love about Fermilab is uh, I, you know, everybody takes pride in their work. It's like, I, my feeling is that we're a big happy family and you know, we all work together for the, for the good of Fermilab. So I, that's one of the things I really like about this lab. In collaboration with universities across the country, the labs around the world, uh, Fermilab is involved with all of those things. If we break the world down into the smallest possible parts, the smallest parts we can come to are elementary or fundamental particles, and there are 12 of them, and three of them are the neutrinos, and they come in three different flavors, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. All right, this is a good time to point out uh, right here the three Vs representing the neutrinos. The V is the ancient Hebrew letter Vav, the sixth letter of the ancient Hebrew alphabet. Um, that there is a triple six. This is not an accident. We have seen the triple Vav and triple six in logos such as the Monster Energy Drink logo, whose slogan is Unleash the Beast, 666, Mark of the Beast, that kind of thing. Um, and we've also seen Volkswagen, if you think of the three Vs, and that's interesting because it's a Mandela effect as well, with the little line separating now the three Vs, Vav, triple six and the vav actually has a meaning it what it looks like it looks like a little nail it the little character it's to bind to connect the nail in the coffin so to speak to connect the dots and this is something we should all be doing we should be decoding our world we should be looking deeply into mandela effects and their meanings there are layers and layers of these meanings 
And that means taking a long, hard look at our world because our world has the answers in front of us. We're just not looking for the meaning. And if we did that, we would see so much more and we'd be able to protect ourselves and our children and our friends and our loved ones from evil. Because I think we can all agree that evil does exist. I think we've all experienced evil ourselves. And so if you think that I'm talking a bunch of hogwash and poppycock about the numbers and the logos and the meanings of things, I urge you to open your mind and consider otherwise because these things are real and a lot of these things are intended. The intent behind them is hidden. Anyway, I should make another video about this because I'm <laughs> getting way off subject. But the point is we need to be decoding our world and looking into meanings of things. Okay, that was just a friendly reminder from your local Decoding the World Commission. <laughs> anyway, on with the rest of the highlights of the video. Now we're trying to study how matter is different than antimatter. That's the holy grail. We live in a matter-dominated universe and we don't know where the antimatter, which should have been created in equal amounts in the early universe, went. So we study neutrinos to understand that. Discovering that neutrinos were the source of the disappearance of all of the antimatter that must have been produced at the Big Bang, um, that would be a great discovery for science because it's one of these questions that, you know, this is such a fundamental principle that matter and antimatter get created in equal portions. And it's sort of embarrassing that we don't know the answer yet, why it is that there's no, there's this huge imbalance between matter and antimatter in the universe. It's like, you know, if you're trying, you can understand, explain away so many things, you know, why is the sky blue and all this kind of stuff, but you can't explain why there are no antiparticles around. Um, that's, uh, so that's why it would be a really great discovery for science. We want to reinvent the laws of physics. And if we discover this process, it'll force us to reinvent those laws of physics. I, th I think theorists are quite emotionally attached to chalkboards. Want to use a chalkboard or a whiteboard? And my answer to that one is chalkboard's better because you can stand there holding your chalk for a long time while you're thinking about what you're going to do. Possibly not saying anything, but just standing there. Solving the mystery of dark energy is a huge challenge because it's, we don't know what dark energy is. <laughs> um, dark energy um, not only pervades the galaxy, it pervades all of empty space. So all the space between the galaxies is full of dark energy. Dark energy is the energy that is in the vacuum, in the emptiest space that you can make. You could describe it as a new kind of energy or you could describe it as a new kind of gravity and we don't know which it is. Okay, you might be wondering why I left all that last <laughs> part in. Um, to my Mandela affected people, this is a weird video and you can look up stuff on your own to see that there is a place called Fermilab and that they do indeed have a bunch of experiments uh, that are particle accelerators and particle colliders and various things of that nature and it is like a CERN and it's in Chicago and nobody knows about it, but this video is super weird. Even weirder, I remind everyone, I felt a sense of familiarity about it. Like I had seen it before, like I had heard about it before. I even had memories of my dad telling me about it. My dad's deceased now. So I know those, <laughs> I know those weren't real memories. Then they have all these parts, we're trying to understand the universe, that says, but they're having it game of softball and that's gonna help them understand the universe. I don't know. I tried to find a better Fermilab video to put in this video about what Fermilab is and there are none, but there are hundreds of videos like this one that they just have, oh, well, you know, Fermilab, ask a scientist day and, you know, go to work with your parents day. and But none of it is a about anything. It's just all them hanging out. The things these people say during this video are very strange to me. They talk about reality a lot, or they use the word real. They talk about particle physics in ways that I am unfamiliar. We were looking for those kinds of things. Okay, okay, I want to point this out. See that, that picture back there on the wall? That's a picture of 
the CDF experiment at Fermilab, which stands for Collider Detector <laughs> at Fermilab. And so the CDF is apparently a predecessor of the CMS experiment. It looks like a miniature CMS experiment. CMS experiment is the compact muon uh, solenoid experiment that's at CERN. And I've always thought that, gosh, doesn't the CMS experiment look pretty alien? We don't, I mean, it should have a predecessor. And now it does. Now, in this reality, whatever have you, it has the CDF experiment and many more like it. And they weren't there before. Fermilab did not used to exist at all. Here are some of its experiments, which mean some of its projects. There's not a complete list of these anywhere, but this is what I've compiled personally. All right, so we've got the CDMS experiment, which is, stands for the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search, straight up searching for dark matter, like we need to find that stuff if it exists. Anyway, CDMS, CDMS2, Super CDMS, and the Snow Lab experiment, which is in Canada. COUPP, COUP, the dark side, that's what it's called, dark side, is the dark matter search. <laughs> they need another one, just called it dark side. Anyway, D0, Minos, Nova, Numi, Boon, and Mini Boon, and Micro Boon is another name for the Mini Boon, or it's another experiment, not quite sure, unclear. Opera, the Tevatron Collider, which was used. It was decommissioned in 2011, some places say 2010. There's little inconsistencies all over this kind of stuff. CERN too, they have little inconsistencies when, when they started running and not. Anyway, the Tevatron Collider, so that one is officially decommissioned. Um, the Holometer Experiment, the Muon G2 Project, and the MU2E, which ugh, sound very similar. All right, um, and I think I already said the, the D0 and the CDF, it, which we just went over the CDF, looks just like a miniature version of the CMS at CERN. All right, and this is this is their big one right now. Oh wait, Minerva detector, that's their underground neutrino stuff. Anyway, their big one they've got right now is called the LBNF project or experiment, whatever, the two terms are kind of interchangeable, but it's nicknamed the Dune project. Yeah, like Dune, like, you know, they're mining for spice, that the whole universe needs and there's all kinds of nefarious things going on with the powers that be overseeing the other people anyway i really want to wrap this up so i want to let this lady tell you about how the main building at fermilab is designed inspired by a cathedral robert wilson actually designed this building the high-rise at wilson hall you know, he was inspired by a cathedral in France somewhere. And so the idea is that in, in the cathedral, you walk in and it's, you know, broad at the bottom and then narrow up at the top. That's, uh, that's what he was inspired by. And it is a really beautiful building. No, it's really not a beautiful building. It's just a building. But it does give you a great idea of how these people are worshipping this science of finding this dark energy, this dark matter. Um, so this is getting too long. I'm going to wrap it up. But the... I want to show you, in that building, there's a picture of the CERN CMS experiment. And so in that cathedral, like, inspired like by a cathedral building, they worship the CMS experiment. I, I just, I'm done. I'm just, I can't even. I hands so thanks for um thanks for watching uh if you made it all the way to the end here please give me some feedback i really can't tell anymore what people have and haven't heard of and what i should do videos about um because I, i'm just always researching so thank you guys and much love to everyone and um i welcome your comments even critiques please because i just don't know how i'm doing here so um much love